Thank you guys for coming. Um, it's, it's really awesome to see you guys here. Um, and, and today's really about you guys too, and you know, um, trying to introduce you to this work and seeing what kind of questions you guys have. So I'm just gonna do a brief overview, probably about half an hour um, of the work, and we're just gonna turn it over to you guys. I just wanna have a conversation, um, see what, what kind of questions you guys have, your readers have, um, so that we can uh, kind of get this work out there and and out to, to everyone that that you're dealing with. So as Sil said, um, I'm a computational biology PhD um, in the Creative Machines Lab at Cornell, um, advised by Hod Libson, um, who does some awesome work in, in 3D printing and in artificial intelligence. Um, and, and today I just want to talk to you about um, the interface between evolution and robotics um, and where I think that, that future is going. Um, so when we think about robotics, this is kind of the, the image that a lot of people think about. Um, this really autonomous humanoid robot that can, you know, walk around the house and be your personal assistant or help you with your chores or, or do whatever and just really interact with you the way that, that any kind of person would. Um, and you see this a lot in sci-fi, we see this a lot, a lot in movies. Um, but if you're, if you're an engineer or in manufacturing or just working in robotics a lot, what you actually see from robots is something like this. We see them all the time um, on the manufacturing floor um, in these really constrained, really um, unflexible environments, which is, which is where they strive right now because every piece of machinery that we see, um, every action has to be hand designed and hand coded by an engineer to, to create the robots that can do this kind of thing. They, they do the same task over and over again um, to the same exact spot, um, sitting on the same exact spot on the floor. The cars come into the same spots. It's really, really a very organized and constrained environment. Um, and, and that's great because the robots that we have now are, are very precise. Um, the engineering behind them is awesome. They have a lot of, a lot of power behind them. Um, but they're not what we think about when we think about robots and having them helping us in our everyday stuff, um, really interacting with us in the world outside of these kind of manufacturing floors. Um, so when, when we see robots trying to go out and about and they've been hand designed like this, um, we see that they, they're not robust to, to working in environments that they're not used to. Um, I hate to you know, poke fun at Honda here, uh, but their, their robot was designed um, to walk up these stairs, and the stairs they ended up designing were you know, a fraction of an inch thicker than, than they had designed it for, um, and since everything's hand-coded in. When it tried to do this on stage, um, you see that, that it, it can't adapt and it can't you know, interact with things in the way that you or I can. Um, and we see robots that, that try to work in these unconstrained environments every day. I think that the best example um, in people's households is, is the Roomba robot um, uh, from iRobot, which is you don't have to keep in one place and you don't have to you know, tell it how big your room is or what shape it is or, or where you have the chair. Um, it can kind of figure those things out on its own um, and work around your house, which, which is really cool. Um, but it's it still is constrained very much um, in its environment. Um, if, if any of you own a Roomba, um, I have one at home and at work. That this this picture itself might not even be realistic. That it might you know get caught on the frills of the of the rug here. Um, pets hate them too. Yeah, pets hate them. Um, they they yell at me all the time when they get stuck on a chair leg or something. It's they're really it's great that that the the software behind them allows them to to move around. Um, without any kind of um, previously designed blueprint of instructions. Um, but the, the bodies really aren't designed um, to be outside of this really flat surface. Um, and, and that's a problem if we want robots to be you know, outside or, or in even more unconstrained environments um, than we see this behaving. And that's, that's a really hard engineering problem to, to you know, be able to interact with things that you've never seen before, that 
your designer hasn't built in some kind of module to help you deal with. But actually, we see that happening all the time, all around us. You know, you or I won't trip if there's a crack in the sidewalk, and and we see animals um, that can run through the woods or tread through water <coughs> or you know deal with gravel, uneven ground, anything like that. Um, nature is amazing at at how it designs things um, and its robustness in there the autonomous nature of, of these kind of animals, I think, is what we want to strive for when we think about designing robots, that we want things that can interact with their environment as naturally as all of these animals do. Um, and, and we see it time and time and time again. Um, I don't have enough room to show you all the examples that nature's come up with um, to help solve this problem. Um, but I can tell you that each one of them was designed the same way. Um, with a really simple algorithm that that we you know talk talk about today is evolution or natural selection, um, and that there is no engineer that has to sit down and think about what kind of you know leg is best for a certain type of terrain or think about how to code in a module to deal with every kind of environment that that the animal is going to interact with. Uh, the process of evolution itself designs things that are autonomous, that are robust, um, that are really interactive with their environment around them and each other. And I think that that's what we want to strive for, for in robotics. Um, so what I do is I work on artificial life or digital evolution or whatever you want to call it um, and evolve creatures, robots, organisms, whatever you want to call them in a computer. We create some kind of substrate. Um, in this case, I give cells of muscle, tissue, and bone, um, and create some kind of survival rule. Uh, in this case, it was faster robots get to live longer and reproduce more. And you see really cool and really amazing things um, pop up <laughs> just from these, these simple rules in this simple environment alone. Um, there was no engineering on my part saying, you know, this is how you should walk, this is how you should look, um, this is how you should behave. Uh, this is all natural selection, just designing robots and designing artificial creatures the way that it designs the animals and, and the humans and everything else that we see in our world today. Um, and, and I think this is a cool example here of how we can start out with something that may not, you know, look great at first, uh, but if we let the ones who are more successful reproduce more and, and that, you know, two successful ones will come together and mate or uh, will create a copy of itself with mutations, the same kind of methods that we see in natural evolution, um, over time through successive generations, we'll see better and better organisms that doing whatever task we have here. In this case, it's just getting from point A to point B, um, which, is, which we use as a proxy for survival and evolution that, that maybe in the wild, if you're able to run away from predators faster or to explore and find more food, you'll survive longer and have more kids. Um, and, and I think that, that in that way, we really, we really are, are sticking true to evolution. And we see really cool stuff as a result of that. Um, without inter any interaction from me or anyone else, um, just this process kind of unfolding itself. Um, and we see lots more examples here, and, and they all look funny, and they do weird things, and they're things that we would never think of. If, we, if I sat down to engineer something that you know, walked around, I would never come up with anything that looks remotely like that. Um, but it works, and it's robust, um, and it develops all on its own, um, which is really cool. Um, and I think that, that more so than ever before, these creatures are, are true to the process of uh, biological evolution, and that they, they have muscles and they have bones, um, and that they are are really easy to anthropomorphize and that, that that's kind of an indication that where 
getting close to kind of figuring out how animals were designed, um, which is, is something that I'm really excited about. I, I fully believe that to, to know that you've understood something is to be able to reverse engineer and to design it yourself, or, or in this case, design the, uh, the algorithm that designs the, these robots. Um, so, so what did we do to make these things more lifelike, more natural, more like animals? Um, one of them was that we, we kind of abstracted away from the traditional robotic approach where it's really constrained um, pieces and modules and joints and, and made of steel and bolts and whatnot. And we wanted to, to be true to nature and introduce muscles and bones and tissues um, and all these sorts of things. And the question when you, that comes up when you introduce a, a simulated muscle or a tissue is, you know, what, what does that mean in reality? How does that transfer? Um, and, and I have some examples here in, in a book um, that my advisor Hodge just wrote about 3D printing that you're more than welcome to come check out after. Um, but the truth of the matter is that we can print almost anything, any kind of design, um, any of those things that you just saw run across the screen, um, we can um, send to a 3D printer and have in front of us in, in a matter of minutes. Um, and that there's been 3D printing that has printed muscle. Um, we've seen both artificial muscles and printing live cells. Um, the, the heart cells have been printed um, to create actuation in, in robotic systems. Um, we've seen tissues being made, people who've, who have 3D printed ears. Um, now is, is a big thing that just came out of Cornell. Um, bone, we see people who, who've been injured who have part of their skull missing and a, a 3D printed piece inserted in there, um, which is, is awesome for people um, who may have been injured in war or something like that, that, that we can really 3D print a lot of the really biological things that, that we see. And, and if we can't, we can print stem cells, which can become any kind of tissue, which is, is really awesome. And that our, you know, our, our um, future there is really open there um, with the flexibility that, that laying down stem cells brings. Um, the other piece where we tried to be really true to nature um, is, is in the DNA, in the, in the encoding. Um, it's a little hard to see on this screen, but up top we see um, embryonic development in, I think this is an insect actually, uh, but it works the same pretty much throughout biology that chemicals are laid down across the embryo um, and each of the cells decide what to be and, and how to develop based on those kind of chemical signals. And in the same way, um, we take our, our starting point, you know, our, our unmolded clay, um, if you will, and lay down a bunch of mathematical functions on top of them that create those kind of chemical gradients um, we see in, in developmental biology. And then we kind of chop up that, that block of clay into a number of individual cells and then have the cells develop their properties based on what kind of chemicals are uh, available to them locally just like happens in biology which which is really cool and the other cool thing about that is that we can you know chop up into whatever kind of resolution um, however many cells we want to um, so that this process can scale to any kind of number of cells, any kind of resolution. Um, we don't have the, the computational power today, but perhaps one day we'll be able to have as many cells in one of these robots as we have you know, in our entire body, something to that kind of scale. And, and while I'm, I'm really excited about what we can produce today, I'm even more excited about trying to understand how algorithms like this work and how we can capture them to design really cool robots so that when the time comes that we're able to produce things on a, a lifelike scale that, that will be good to go out of the gates there, which I think will be really exciting because 
if history has told us anything, it's that computers are only going to get better and faster. Um, and I think that's going to be true, especially in the near future. Um, but a part of this research that, that really gets ignored um, for the most part is the ties to, to our fellow researchers in biology or psychology or neuroscience or evolutionary biology. Um, that we focus a lot on what this algorithm can produce and what it can create, but I really like to focus a lot as well on how those things came about. And you saw the, the creature kind of develop in front of your eyes earlier. Um, and I think that gives us a lot of clues about how evolution works um, and about how things come about. We can recreate things artificially um, in a fraction of the time and in vast numbers um, that we can look at things more statistically um, with greater certainty than we can just looking at our one single instance um, of evolution. I have probably thousands of, of lineages on my computer here where if we try to dig up fossils, not only do we have to do a lot of guesswork there, but we just have one line to go on. Um, and I think that that's really cool into answering questions about how things come about. Um, and this example here is, uh, is Rich Lenski over at Michigan State, um, who does some awesome work with E. coli bacteria because they're small enough and fast enough reproducing that, that they're one of the systems where we can kind of look at evolution um, experimentally in a biological standpoint. And, and yes, it takes decades even to to have a, an evolutionary history there, but they have decades of frozen E. coli um, that we can look back on and, and, uh, and explore and create very purposeful experiments with to, to try to answer questions that we have. And at the same time, they have uh, Avita, which is a system that, uh, this is a, an old copy, but may not look a lot like what I do. Um, but really abstracts from the same kind of principles, the same idea of um, abstracting evolution uh, for, for it speeded up digital evolution. Um, and they can compare and ask questions between the two substrates, which I think is a really cool thing. Um, and I'm really excited to, to take our system and be able to ask questions about um, how animals develop and, and our, our own um, evolutionary histories. Um, so what we've done is we've created these soft robots that, I don't know if you remember this one or not, but it galloped a lot like a horse. And not only the behavior, but the morphology is very similar too. Um, we've been able to design things that, that work and look and behave a lot like the things that happen in nature through natural evolution. Um, and I think that that has given us a really cool insight into how we can design things um, automatically with these evolutionary algorithms to create things that um, create robots that will be a lot more robust and a lot more autonomous um, in our being able to kind of get away from the manufacturing floors and interact with us on an everyday basis um, based on how things are created in nature. Um, so I'm really excited about that as well as uh, the scientific questions we can ask doing evolution um, on the time scale of hours or, or days as opposed to you know millions and billions of years. Um, as Sil mentioned, this work um, will be presented and published in the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference, which is, uh, I'll be flying out to in a couple of months. So if anyone is interested in reading that paper or learning more about the field in general, um, feel free to, to talk to me about that. Uh, I'd also, while I'm up here, really like to thank the other members of the, this research team um, who've been really awesome in supporting me, uh, Rob, Jeff, and Hod. Uh, in the Creative Machines Lab, and Jeff has actually moved on and has his own lab at University of Wyoming. Um, and also to DARPA and the National Science Foundation for helping support this research, um, and, and to NASA for jumping on and promising to support 
future research like this. Um, and also John Hiller, a uh, former student in the lab, for, for his awesome work with the, uh, with the simulator. So i really just like to open it up to you guys now and kind of just have a conversation about what you guys think. Yeah? So when the, when the little robots reproduce, are you combining two different kinds of robots? Or is it just sort of like two of that same sort of morphology type that's uh, reproducing? Yeah, um, it totally depends. It's, we have, actually I think I might have an extra slide, that just kind of walks through, I'm sure you all know how natural selection works. Um, and, and the question really is, when we do this selection, what is, what's left? Are the robots very similar? Or are they very different? Um, and that, that depends, um, depends a lot on the algorithm itself. In this case, uh, many of them were somewhat similar, but we also see huge differences across them. And, and some of the future work that I'll be doing is actually um, incentivizing even more differences that we can cre maintain a, um, a diversity of robots um, as we go forward, which I think will be even cooler towards getting um, faster and, and more exciting evolution. What do you start with? I mean, do you just start with the algorithm and let it go, or do you start with a like, base creature? We, you could start with a base creature if you wanted to, because um, evolution is an iterative process. So um, if you had something in mind that, that you wanted to, we, you could. Um, but in this case, we just start from randomness, um, which is the way that, that evolution started for us. And I, Whenever I can, I like to stay as true to that as possible. Um, so yeah, you saw, um, in this case, we constrain the, the creatures to this certain space. And you just saw that space randomly filled at the beginning of the lineage. Um, and that's the way that all the creatures start out. So you mean like just a random assortment of the different types of tissues? Exactly, yeah. And, it, and most of the random ones are, are pretty bad, but Every once in a while, it'll get lucky, and there'll be one that's slightly better than the others, um, and that one will reproduce more. And and over time, you see that we kind of get some really amazing things from that random junk. Yeah. Have there been um, evolutionary biologists that have gotten interested in this sort of model, maybe to solve their to help solve their own questions? Yeah, uh, I I haven't personally worked with any. Um, but we see those kind of cross-disciplinary um, questions all the, the time. Especially the model gets more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah I, w I would hope to, um, especially um, when we look at, at higher level um, kind of things. In this case, we use a really simple system where um, the robots don't have any kind of intelligence on top of you know, how their bodies look, and it's a it's a really simple task in just trying to move from point A to point B. Um, but I think the fact that we can understand this algorithm and how it works um, gives us an indication that we can create more complex environments and more complex robots. Um, and I think that, that as we start to get to some of the higher level stuff that we see you know, in animals or hopefully even in humans, um, that there'll be a lot more interest in that kind of stuff. Um, but Rich. Um, Lenski, who I showed you, is an evolutionary biologist. So there are certain other places that that have that foster that kind of collaboration already. Yeah. Um, could you give an example of like different materials you might use for the different kinds of tissue types? Uh, yeah. Um, so from if we want to talk about it artificially, um, this is a, a system that comes from uh, the White Size Group at, at Harvard. Um, and uses silicone to print a, an empty mold that you could think of like one of our little cells um, and that you can pump air to and actuate. And I think that would be a really cool tissue muscle kind of thing. Um, and, and we could use live cells, as I mentioned earlier, um, to be really true towards actually not just creating robots, but you could almost call that creating animals. Um, it's, it's not something that, that I want to say that, that we're doing is creating animals, but 
um, you see that we're getting closer and closer. Um, so I, I definitely want to explore more the kinds of tissues and whatnot that, that will go into these. Um, but I'm focused so far mostly on the process itself. You had a question? Uh, during the, the, the creature's evolutionary process, do you see any characteristics like aggression or collaboration among during this evolution? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so right now, um, just because of the, the computational limits that we have, um, we're just using this proxy of locomotion speed as, as how well uh, a creature would move about in its environment and get to food or get away from predators or something like that. And we don't actually, so we simulate them one at a time and just look at how their, how their behavior leads to faster and faster creatures. What, what I would love to do in the future, um, and we can, we can wait for, for more advanced computation or look at simpler systems, um, which is what I'll likely do, um, is to simulate all of these robots at once in a, a really rich uh, ecosystem in an environment that would foster things like cooperation or aggression um, towards others, uh, even, even at a small scale. And I think that, that that's something that's really important and that isn't, um, isn't addressed in a lot of these algorithms that look at each individual on its own because that's, that's not the way that you know, animals exist. Um, but, and that also brings up a, a great point about how we can answer the, or look at those kind of questions in evolutionary biology about how aggression or how cooperation came about. Um, and it's really cool to think about what kind of selection pressure, what kind of environment, or even what kind of peers um, would lead to something like that. And that's questions that I hope to answer in these artificial evolution systems like this. So you had a as question? As far as the simple environment that you did program, I mean, what went into that? I noticed some of the creatures seemed to be jumping. Did that mean that you had to program gravity into the environment so that none of them would just fly off? Yeah, we have a, a full physics engine behind this. Um, so the things that we see in the bodies and the, the shapes that we see are all true to physical reality. So we would hope to be able to bring them into our world here and have similar behavior. Um, but yes, we have gravity, and, and one of the, the cool things about this simulator um, that John did an excellent job um, with is the fact that we can get really soft tissues and, and that things you know, deform when they hit the ground or things like that that a lot of the times we see abstracted away um, and that is making our physics environment even more rich. Good question. Would you mind going back to the analogy between DNA and algorithm? I want to share with yeah. you. I would love to. Um, so this is, is kind of a, a point that I skipped over um, just for, for the sake of time. But whenever one of the key aspects of evolution is genes and heritab heritability um, in that we have to be able to pass down our genetic material and whatever makes us successful down to successive generations. Um, and so, so we need some kind of representation of what a creature looks like, behaves like. Um, and, and in this case, we use what's called a central or a compositional pattern producing network, um, which is just a fancy way of saying um, a network with a bunch of mathematical functions like this. Um, so that, that as the information goes down through this network, um, we can see a lot of things that occur in developmental biology like symmetry or like repetition um, or, or even you know, variations that, that are outside of that. It's a very information rich way of encoding a, a high resolution um, shape like this with a lot of materials and a lot of properties into a single network, um, which is, is very cool because we know that DNA 
um, doesn't directly code everything in, in your body, everything that makes you up. Um, it's also a very information rich um, method for, for describing what exactly an individual is. Um, and the way that we make that network into a creature is just to you know, iteratively go through each of those cells that, that make it up and say what kind of chemicals are going on here. Um, what is it saying that you should develop into? Uh, does that answer what your question, or do you have a? I think so. If not, feel free to uh, come back with something more specific as well. Yeah. Uh, how do you define robots specifically? What about these simulations that make, makes them robots? That's um, something that a lot of people have thought about that I have not as much personally. But for me, what makes these things? Um, robots or animats or whatever you want to call them, these artificial creatures, is that they're embodied. Um, that it's not some piece of software that's sitting in a mainframe. Um, it's something that can actually, you know, sense its environment, can interact with its environment. In this case, this environment is just the physics engine. Um, but it is in that sense of physical reality that this thing is embodied within. And I think that that embodiment is really, when you boil it down, the, the key to robotics versus software. Yep. I came in late, so excuse me if this is repetitive, but I was wondering if this reminds me, it looks quickly like something like Hod Libsyn does. It, it is very much what Hod Libsyn okay. does. Um, yeah, he's my advisor oh, okay. uh, at Cornell. Um, are and, you using the same engine or are you using something different? Than, I mean, he went, we went through the whole math and I don't know if anybody wants to do that, but I want to do. I, I, I want to ask you about your. I also want to ask you about the key to that kind of approach after you talk. Tell me about this system. Yeah, uh, feel free to, to talk to me after about a more in-depth uh, introduction. Um, but yeah, we we use a lot of the same ideas um, in just abstracting away evolution um, into something that we can create digitally. Um, and each time we do that, if we look at different questions, maybe we'll do it a slightly different way. Um, but I think the, the framework is very similar. I think that, I think that always, I was always wondering about something, some kind of graphical optimization method or something that kind of uses geometry rather than discrete equations or something. Is it, I, I recall there was something of that in there. And that seemed to be the trick, kind of. You know? Yeah, and I think that that's very much done in, in this network here, isn't that? We're describing something mathematically versus describing it um, in a digital manner where, where we would have to you know, describe each bit as we went, that we have you know, a, an overlying pattern that we map onto that. And then I guess what I'm trying to say is, or ask is, what is the mathematical method of choosing the optimal one that you actually go with in the math? You know, how, do you, how does that make decision? How is that decision made? Or are you trying, choosing uh, the highest numbers of some value or something. Yeah, that's, that's traditionally how uh, evolutionary algorithms work in, in engineering, is that you want to optimize some kind of number, um, you know, whether it's minimizing density to maximizing strength or something like that in an en engineering problem. What I want to do is just create um, these robots to, in this case, walk the farthest. Um, so okay. it's so you, just the, you put a metric on it, and if it doesn't, then that's the metric. That yeah, some some kind of proxy for survival, and I just let the fittest survive. Um, Does hot stuff have uh, the physics engine in it? Sorry to throw or to name, you know, multiple. but does hot have a physics engine in it as well? Uh, some of hot stuff, yes, uses okay. physics. Um, okay. Some is uh, more discrete equations, um, but okay. yeah, we we use this kind of stuff in a whole bunch of applications. Um, which is w one of the cool things about um, a, an algorithm like this that you know you could treat as a black box optimization in just about any kind of uh, you know any kind of problem that you have that we see people across all parts of engineering using things like this to create um, ideas and designs that human engineers you know would never think of in a million years as as you can see um, or as you saw before. Any other questions? Yep. The uh, terrain, just like the flat plain, like we saw in the video? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, in this case, it was just you know, a very simple, flat environment um, just to 
to test out it and make sure that we could do these things like use this encoding and, and use muscles and bones and stuff. Uh, but, but that was part of the previous question that, that I really want to make this as true to biological evolution as we can and part of that is having a really rich environment that has obstacles and, and other creatures and all sorts of things that I hope to abstract away from um, going forward. Yep. So when you make physical models of these, are you envisioning something actuated with air, electricity, um, you know, what's the life for it? Yeah, we, we've thought about both of those things. Um, there's, there's ones actuated with, with air from, from Harvard here that you saw earlier. Um, we tried um, using pressure before to actuate. This is one that came out of the lab before um, that has multi material um, setup that reacts differently to pressure um, from each material. And, and we've also thought about, um, as you see here, using um, kind of building blocks inside of these robots that could be mechanically actuated and run um, by electricity. And I think that all of these venues need more exploration and it's something that uh, I'm hoping to look at more and and see kind of what avenue I want to pursue, as well as the idea of pursuing things um, biological, like live tissues. Aside from motion, and what would be another function? <clears throat> yeah, you can you can literally think of of any function that you would like. We can make into a selection pressure. Um, so instead of you know just walking around, if you wanted something that'll pick up your kids' toys. I mean, we could have a, a, an environment where we would have to pick up objects. Or if we wanted to look at you know, um, cooperation, we could have some task where one individual couldn't solve it, but maybe two can. And how do they evolve the ability to talk to each other and to cooperate? Um, I think that, that what kind of questions we can explore with this is almost limitless, which is one of the things that really excites me the most about it. You had a question? You talked earlier about um, uh, 3D printing of bones and tissues. Yeah. Is that currently being done? That is currently being done. Um, this is, is Hod's latest book, uh, Fabricated, The New World of 3D Printing. Um, and we can see some examples. I'm sure that you can't see it from here, um, but maybe we can come up later. And you know, here is an artificial limb, a piece of a jaw, um, a CT scan, recreation of a foot, um, some a heart valve um, printed with artificial tissue. Um, there's all sorts of really cool things that, that we can 3D print. And, uh, but is there a human host for that right now, or is this still in these you know, very early <coughs> prototype things? I, I think that, that we're still exploring and prototyping, but some of these things actually are in um, actual human beings as well. Um, what? Uh, I know that the, the jaw pieces and the bones I know are in, um, in people's skulls. Um, I, there's been talk about um, organ printing. I don't know um, if that's actually been used in a, in a live human yet, um, but I could look more into that and, and get back to you about the details, yeah. One of the studies they just published at Cornell was they did print a human ear made of live cells out of a 3D printer. Hasn't been attached to a human yet, but they've printed animal ears and attached the ears to the animal. And, what and was the, the, the body's less um, opt to, to reject it because it's made from the actual cells from that animal. So they've successfully been able to do it. And, and in fact, instead of rejecting it, the cells around it will you know, help bond to it and regenerate and restore hearing to that animal, yeah. Very cool stuff. So going back to the first slide of the, the little vacuum cleaner robot. So yep. the idea is someday the company that makes that robot can take one of these little blobs here, virtually speaking, and drop it into a virtual living room with lots of dirt and say, you know, instead of making it with bones and tissue, make it with whatever metals they want to manufacture out of it. And eventually they can just get this thing to evolve to the perfect vacuum cleaner. Yeah, I, and we, we could have it, you know, evolving in real time as, as it picks stuff up, or we could have it, you know, evolving beforehand and, 
and use it more as an optimization method where we've found the commercial vacuum cleaner through this evolutionary process. Um, I could see both being, you know, beneficial in that doing it beforehand gives them this thing that they can now mass produce um, while having it more adaptive um, leads it to be able to adapt itself to its unique environment. Um, maybe you've got, you know, a lot of clutter in your house and you need something with longer legs that can step over it or something like that. Um, but yeah, we, I think that, that having robots that are autonomous and, and can interact in unstructured environments will, will do a lot of things um, and, and help humans in a lot of ways um, as in, in tasks that are very you know, repetitive that, or, or boring or mindless or things like that. Things like cleaning um, is, I think is something that, that these robots could be used for. Um, janitorial work, um, construction is a great one in that uh, not only is it repetitive but it's also quite dangerous sometimes uh, where robots might be great. Um, search and rescue is also really dangerous. Um, we would love to have robots instead of people climbing into, you know, collapsed buildings and stuff like that. House on fire and do the same process. Yeah. And find what type of thing could best go into that. House yeah, it's something that that works in really unstructured environments would be great there. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited about the commercial applications as well as as the the uh, scientific parts of it as well. Yep. I was looking at the video that was on the press release, and I didn't notice any, I was wondering whether you saw any engineering, quote unquote, engineering convergence among the results. In other words, coming up with two legs or something like that, you know, because of lowest energy kind of situation or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting theoretical question, whether or not um, a specific environment will tend to converge towards a certain kind of method. Um, or whether, you know, we're in this instance of evolution as we are, that we look and behave the way we are just completely by chance, that it could have gone a whole host of different directions. Um, and I think that that's a cool question to ask. And I'm really not sure whether or not we can, we can say that. We can certainly set up and force yeah, this into right? right into d divergence or convergence. That'd um, be more like designing the vacuum cleaner from you know an existing product or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That we could certainly do that kind of work where, where we seed it with some idea and just iteratively improve on that versus starting from scratch too. Yeah. Yep. How often do you get like questions like, are these things going to take over the world? And what do you say, and what do you say in response to that? About as frequently as you would think. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think that computers and that um, humans behave in really different ways. Um, and that the things that, that people are good at and the things that computers are good at are really different. Um, we, we behave differently, we think differently, um, we just have different basic architectures. And so I think that while people are, are always going to be concerned about that kind of stuff from what they read in sci-fi or see in the movies, um, I think that it would be really cool in the, in the future, we'll have um, more of a collaboration than, than a competition that will each be good at doing certain things and bad at others, and that working together with computers will be much more fruitful than you know, them trying to take over the world. <laughs> Anyone else? Which one of these guys is your favorite? <laughs> oh, there's so many. Um, I, that one's entertaining. Um, it almost looks like it's trying to develop wings. Yeah. yeah. Reminds me of the, uh, the blow up balloons you see in front of like car dealerships <laughs> and stuff. Um, the first couple, I like this one a lot too. Um, it's like an accordion. Yeah. yeah. Just the, the, I would. Its heels, I kind of like. It jumps up, clicks its heels, and then moves it. <laughs> yeah, that, it, that it's another one I would never think of. Um, the the first couple in the video I actually really like a lot too. Um, I was really excited to see uh, the very first one in that it's the one that I showed at the end that looked like uh, looked like the galloping horse, and that 
we saw you know, a large bone structure and a, a really cool dynamic gait and that that was something that was, re was seen in biology and, and isn't um, often evolved in, in other types of simulations. So that was kind of one of my really exciting points along this way that we could create something that's, that's that true to biology. Yep. <clears throat> Are you going to, is this program going to be involved in the new Applied Sciences School on Roswell Island? Uh, robotics program? Not specifically my lab. Um, we're at the, on the Ithaca campus, um, but I could certainly see applications there and, and these techniques used in engineering as well as um, more theoretically as we approach them. Cool. Well, if no one has any more questions, um, I'll be around, so feel free to come up to me when something pops into your thank mind. You but thank you. thank you guys. Yeah, this is, this is a lot of fun.